today I want to share with you uh, as we continue to look at the idea, this, this truth, this concept, right, of a new wineskin that Jesus spoke of and that is really supposed to be what we all get to function in, right, what we all get to experience together as the body of Christ. And as I've been saying, we are in, I believe, a very momentous period in church history where because of everything that we have uh, gone through over these past months has actually prepared us to shift more fully into the heart's desire of our Lord. And I don't know about you, but in, in my heart, I want to make sure that he is so fully satisfied with everything that he desires, everything that he's done to make it possible for his eternal desires to be satisfied. And so we're going to look at that today and kind of maybe give you a history from a prophetic standpoint of why, why this is so important. You know, I mean, wh why would, would Jesus even care about a new wineskin and why would he want for us to know what that looks like and how to actually engage in that kind of, of, of an experience with him? So in Luke 19.10, Jesus makes a very interesting statement. He says that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, I can remember many, many years ago reading that scripture and scratching my head saying, well, I don't understand, Lord. Why are you saying that you are here to seek and save that which was lost instead of those who are lost? Because, you know, back then, all we understood was that you know, we're to save souls, right? Soul winning. And listen, that is, <laughs> that's right up there at the top of the list. But I didn't get it. I was seek and save. And I even looked at the Greek and that's exactly how it's framed or phrased in the Greek. That which was lost. Well, you know, sometimes you, you can ask the Lord about things and it, just takes a number of years before you are, I guess, ready to really understand. And that's what it was like for me. And what helped me to begin to understand why, why Jesus phrased it that way was when I realized what actually had been lost in the Garden of Eden. Again, we, you know, we think of the story there and we, we realize that, you know, that Adam sinned and it created this separation between him and God, but it's still something where we look at it as, well, we need to be saved. Souls need to be saved. Yes, that's true, but until God began to unpack why, what it was that he was actually after from the beginning, right, then we begin to understand. So, what started me down this journey of, of really grasping more fully what Jesus was saying when he said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. In Genesis, where we have this description in, in chapter 3 of, of Adam and Eve in the garden, it says that they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the implication there, of course, is that this is a normal thing that the Lord would come and would walk with them in the cool of the day and just enjoy time with Adam and Eve. And as I began to imagine that and meditate on that, I realized that just how profound that picture really is, that it speaks to the core of the Father's motivation the Trinity's motivation in creating the human race, that we were created for them to enjoy a kind of fellowship, a kind of relationship 
that they could not have with any of the other created beings that they had made heretofore. Because all of the spiritual beings that they had created, they were living in the spirit realm. They could see the majesty and the glory of God. And, and it, it was different than you and I who are walking with him by faith. Yes, we can see, we can experience, we can feel, but it's so, so much different because we are having to believe and trust, right? And enter into that kind of relationship where we really do have a choice, <laughs> okay? I've used the analogy before, you know, of a pet, you know, a dog especially that, that you know, seems so loving toward us, right? But it's instinctual. They really don't have the ability to choose. They don't get angry and walk away and say, I'm done with you, you know? And so that was important. And when you understand that, all of a sudden, so, so many pieces start coming together as you look at the, the Bible in general as a whole, right? So <laughs> when Adam and Eve sinned, God said, if you eat of this fruit, the day you eat of it, you shall die. Now, they didn't die physically, but what happened? They died spiritually. What does that mean? That means that from that moment, there, were, there became a separation, a distance between them and God. And God no longer had the same level of intimacy and connection with them that he had enjoyed before. And that state of affairs continued from that time up until Jesus cried out, it is finished on the cross. So as you as we look through the Old Testament, <laughs> we just see over and over and over again how the Father expresses his heart's desire concerning the human race. Now, obviously in the Old Covenant, he's doing that uh, in the Old Testament, he's doing that with respect to his chosen people, Israel. But nonetheless, it remains a heartfelt expression of his eternal desire. So Exodus 25, he says, let them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. Whew, can you feel that? I, you know, every time I read that, it's like now I, I, I get it. It's like, let them construct a sanctuary for me because I want to dwell among them. See, we have a father who is not content to sit on his throne in glory and observe passively from a distance these, you know, those of us, period, right? Whom he's created, whom he loves. And we, we see this now over and over and over again, right? Israel, unfortunately, Hmm. when they had the chance, rejected it. They said to Moses, oh no, we're afraid. You go up on the mountain. You, you, you know, deal with God and you come back and report to us. We're going to stand here at a distance. <laughs> Unfortunately, that was their response, right? So he talks about this tent of meeting where, that he gave to Moses to create, to construct, right? He says, I'm going to meet with you. I'm going to speak with you. I will meet there with the sons of Israel, right? Over and over again in Exodus, I will dwell among the sons of Israel. I want to dwell among them because I am the Lord their God. Leviticus 26, I will make my dwelling among you and my soul will not reject you. I also will walk among you and be your God and you shall be my people. So you hear, you know, all you've got to do is go through the New Te or the Old Testament rather and, and, and just read all of these various statements that the Father makes about wanting to be with his people, dwelling with them, walking with them. That's his heart's desire, right? And, and if we continue on here, Deuteronomy, 
uh, four, he talks about, you know, don't be making any, uh, you know, graven images or, or any sort of idols to try to represent who I am because you didn't see me in a physical form, right? He says, that's not who I am. So don't try to, to recreate me in, in some kind of a physical way, right? Just know that I am your God and you are a people for my own possession. Whew. I mean, right there, right there. When God says that, I have chosen you as a people for my own. In other words, you're mine. You belong to me. Not in, in, a, in a manipulative, controlling kind of a way, which you might, you know, if, you, if you've had that experience where someone does that, you belong to me. No, it's a, it's a thing of security, of safety, of, 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 you know, exulting in his love and his presence that he's chosen us for that sort of, of intimate relationship with himself, right? So, um, you know, on and on, I can, I can, so many of these scriptures, um, Moses declares to them, the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you and to defeat your enemies before you, therefore your camp must be holy, right? And uh, he must not see anything indecent among you or he will turn away from you. Under the old covenant, that was absolutely the case. But the point that, that, Yes, he's walking in the midst of us to give us victory. That never changed. That never changed, right? So when Israel went to Samuel, the prophet, and said, Hey, we want a king like the other nations, right? Well, what were they saying? They were saying, <laughs> having a God that we can't see isn't enough. Having a king that we can't talk to face to face isn't enough. And so God actually says to Samuel, Go, do it, because they haven't rejected you, they've rejected me, right? So, I, I don't know, I can go over more and more of these scriptures. Do that if you have the time. I highly recommend that you go through uh, the Old Testament and just look at all the scriptures where God says, I want to dwell in your midst. Make my sanctuary. All of these scriptures so illustrate his eternal desire that was robbed, right? That was stolen from him by the enemy when Satan successfully deceived Eve and Adam chose to throw in his lot with her, okay? That separation remained until Christ dealt with it. And, you know, Jesus, in when we move into the New Testament, right, he says that uh, Matthew 18, very familiar verse, he says, just two or three getting together in my name. Guess what? I'm showing up. I will be there. <laughs> I just love that. But it's the same thought, isn't it? That I want to be in the midst of you. And when he is, is questioned by the Pharisees in Luke 17 about the kingdom of God itself and the nature of that kingdom, right? Uh, he says to them, you're not going to see the kingdom coming <clears throat> with armies and, and, you know, those kinds of physical signs because the kingdom of God is in your midst. And that actually can be expanded to say is within you and among you, the kingdom of God in your midst. What is that? That's the presence of God in your midst, within you, and among you. Whew, come on, that's what he's looking to establish under this new covenant that absolutely is a game changer. It, it changes everything, right? That's why Jesus came. He came to seek and to save that which was lost the relationship, the intimacy, the connection, the ability that, that God lost to actually enter into people's lives, right? We understand now that when we say yes to Jesus, that Holy Spirit comes to dwell in our hearts, in our spirit, man. We become one with Christ. My goodness! 
He's getting more and more of his heart's desire satisfied. Now, listen, we understand as well that for a lot of us, we're still kind of waking up to this reality because most of us, and I'm, you know, I'm not much different than you guys either. I might be a little further along the road in this, you know, only because of God's grace. But I too struggle with living as if I am still separated from him. Living with the idea that he's there and I'm here. We all are still struggling with that. And that's the greatest challenge that we have is shifting into that mindset into that truth that that reality right that we will never ever be separated from him again because he dwells within us we are one with him you cannot separate us from him okay and and what that is like the awareness of that that's the awakening that many of us are starting to experience that we we walk now with a greater and greater awareness of our oneness with Christ so when uh, all of this was still being um, formed, you know, in the heart of God, we had some interesting situations that occurred to give us some, you know, kind of insights, deeper insights into what Father God is after. And one of them is the situation in, in 1 Samuel where the Philistines had successfully uh, conquered Israel and they stole the Ark of the Covenant. And of course, we understand that, that the Ark of the Covenant was the one thing that physically represented the presence of God to Israel. Now, obviously, it wasn't an idol. It was something that God had, had uh, you know, required, but it really literally represented the presence of God to the nation of Israel. Philistines stole it. They paid a price because their idols got knocked down. There were, you know, diseases and all kinds of crazy things that happened. So they said, well, we got to get rid of this thing. So they put it on a cart and and somehow the oxen pulled it back into, into uh, uh, Israel where it was recovered. And King David was like, dude, we got to get this thing back to Jerusalem. So what does he do? He puts it on a cart. And in the process of trying to get back to Jerusalem with it, it hits a bump in the ground, and this poor dude, Uzziah, reaches out to steady things and dies. And David is like, whoa, what, what is that? Well, he goes and researches and realizes, oh my gosh, you don't put the Ark of the Covenant on a cart it is supposed to be carried by the Levites. My friends, can I tell you how powerful a prophetic message that is? When David learned that and made the adjustment, they were successful in carrying the ark into Jerusalem as a symbol of the presence of God. Okay, There is nothing that we can construct physically to contain his presence okay the the cart that prophetically it represents all manner of man-made programs buildings just you name it religious things in an attempt to carry the presence of God doesn't work that way because we as the royal priesthood we're the only ones who actually carry the presence of God. This is why the new wineskin is so necessary. And, and the church, unfortunately, got off on the wrong track when Constantine institutionalized the church. Now, all of a sudden, instead of the presence being released and carried by the royal priesthood, the presence of God was believed to be present in these cathedrals, in these buildings, stewarded by professional clergy. Okay. Whew. 
As David found out, you don't put the presence of God on a cart. So very important lesson that we need to understand when it comes to why is this so important? Why is a new wineskin where Holy Spirit calls the shots as Jesus directs, as the head of the body when we gather, okay? It's because we're the ones that carry and release the presence of God into that meeting, into that circumstance, into that situation, into society itself. It's us. It's you and me. Another fascinating example of how we can so easily get off track on this is when Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him up onto the mountain and he was transfigured. Remember that? He was there. He had a, he had a meeting with Moses and Elijah. And in the process, his true nature began to be revealed and he began to glow and, and just give off this amazing light. <laughs> Can you imagine that if we could see one another like that, what we would see? But what was Peter's response to this amazing situation? <laughs> he says, Lord, it's great that we're here because we're, we're going to build a booth for Moses and for you and for Elijah. <laughs> you know, it's like, wait, what? You know, and they hear the voice of the Father. This is my beloved Son. Listen to Him. Listen to Him. So what is this booth thing? Well, you know, I asked the Lord about that. I said, why did Peter even think to do that? And basically the Lord showed me that that tendency that we have as humans <laughs> is so prevalent that we have to guard against it. When God does amazing things, right? we have a tendency to want to honor and venerate and memorialize what God did in some physical way. So building a booth to Moses represents the past moves of God, the things that he did, you know, and, and what happens is, of course, those things become this generation's and next's rituals and traditions. And so, no, 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 no. Yes, we're going to remember and we're going to thank God for the testimony of the things that he did in the past, but they're in the past. They no longer have really, other than testimony, have any relevance to how we do things today, right? Then you've got building a booth to Elijah. Well, what is that? Elijah's a prophet. And unfortunately, there are segments of the body of Christ that want to focus exclusively on the next thing that God is going to do. God is about to do X, Y, and Z. God will be doing this. We're prophesying. And instead of looking at what are we to do here and now, how are we to actually act in this present situation to bring the kingdom, the forward-looking focus prevents that. There's just no way, you know, because they've built a booth to the future and they're so future focused that they're no good in the present. Even Jesus, building a booth for Jesus is not good because what we're doing there is we're saying, oh, what Jesus is doing now is so important that we will never move away from that. <laughs> okay. I was in a situation many years ago where the leadership of the church got a vision from God about what he wanted them to do and they enshrined it. It became an idol that was worship. Well, we can never move off of this vision because this is the vision God gave us. <laughs> As if to say the Lord can, can never amend or change the thing that he has spoken, which of course is absurd. But again, these tendencies that we have, we've got to guard against that. We live in the eternal now with Christ. And he gets to call the shots at every turn. And so we don't memorialize the past and look to the past for guidance. We don't look to the future only and, and whatever God's showing us he's going to do, that's all we focus on. Nor do we take what the Lord has said for us now to do and make that a shrine, a memorial, 
you know, an idol that we never move from. We're that, that's the beauty of the new wine skin. It's flexible. It, it can move and shift and 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 go, you know, into places that a rigid structure never could fit. OK, so that I hope that's helpful in in giving you insight into why Jesus is so, so fixed on creating this new wine skin for us to function in because he wants to be able to lead and guide us in every circumstance, every situation as he desires, right? Our agendas, they get laid down, okay? There's only one Lord, there's only one head, and it's Christ. And we've got to begin to learn how to function together in that way, right? And that's where God's taking us. This, all this that has happened, you know, that where we can no longer meet as usual has primed us for this new refocusing of our attention onto what he wanted from the very beginning. All right. <laughs> Going all the way back to Genesis. Wow. I hope that's helpful for you. Um, I hope it's, it's encouraging. It is hugely encouraging to me because I'm so excited about seeing this now begin to burst and, and, you know, multiply all across the earth, even greater than it already is. So, mm, 